Welcome, Eagles, to another episode of Trad Cat Night Radio. I am Eric Ajewski, founder and owner of Trad Cat Night, your one-stop website for all of the day's latest church apostasy news and end-time news. Now, Trad Cat Night is featured all over the alternative media circuit, and I'm doing my best to keep you up to date on all the latest happenings as we head closer to the fruition of the third secret of Fatima, my good friends. Make sure you subscribe to Trad Cat Night. Uh, click the notification button right now here on YouTube. As many of you know, there is awful lot of censorship going on across all of the social media platforms, something I talked about with Syrian Girl uh, yesterday. And uh, I advise you all to get to SoundCloud.com. Find Trad Cat Night there uh, where you can find these talks in MP3 format. Also, TradCatNight.org, the sister site, has these talks these podcasts in mp3 format as well and of course you can search trad cat night across any social media outlet twitter facebook google plus to get all of the latest content and folks if you've got suggestions for a special guest for trad cat night radio please send them to me at apostle of mary at hotmail.com and i've got another great show for you today uh, a returning guest and we had a blockbuster talk uh, it was actually in September 2016, so it's been quite some time since we have had Hugh back on the program. And we had a great talk concerning the two frameworks at play, creationism versus evolutionism. And so my guest today is Mr. Hugh Owen, uh, who is a teacher, headmaster, religious education coordinator for more than 30 years. The past 20 years, he has worked as a professional writer, editor, publishing many books and articles. Uh, Mr. Owen currently directs the Colby Center for the Study of Creation, which provides a forum for Catholic theologians, philosophers, and natural scientists from all over the world who are dedicated to making sure uh, that the evidence for and against the theory of evolution is made available to church leaders and the lay faithful. And again, his website is colbycenter.org. Uh, In our last talk, we basically really covered how evolution crosses over from the science world, if you will, into theology, and we all know what we're up against uh, in this crisis in the church, um, but it's not going to be specifically what we're talking about today, although I'm sure we'll probably mention it. Uh, Mr. Owen wants to talk about St. Colby, the Immaculata, and the goodness of original creation, and what we'd like to do now is hand it over to Mr. Hugh Owen for a prayer, and then just get us started, uh, get the, the, the train going, uh, Mr. Owen, and we'll just We'll just go off of your lead. All right. Thank you so much, Eric. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Ave Maria, gratia plena, Dominus tecum. Benedicta tu in mulieribus, et benedictus fructus ventris tui, Jesus. Sancta Maria, Mater Dei, ora pro nobis peccadoribus, nunc et in hora mortis nostre. Amen. Saint Maximilian Colby, pray, pray for, for us. us. All you holy angels and saints, pray for us. All you poor souls in purgatory, pray for us. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Well, Eric, it's great to be back with you. And I'd like to begin by recalling that Almighty God worked the greatest public miracle since the resurrection in Fatima, Portugal, just over 100 years ago, to prove that the message of Our Lady of Fatima was urgent and true. And as all your listeners know, one of the things that she said in that message was that if mankind did not repent, if we did not heed her request, Russia would spread its errors throughout the world, causing wars and persecutions of the church. Now, if you go to our website and read our material, you will come to understand that the principal error that took hold in Russia in 1917 was not communism, it was evolutionism. It was evolutionism that made atheists of the principal leaders of the Bolshevik Revolution. Lenin was a baptized Orthodox Christian. He lost his faith because he came to believe in evolution as a young man, and his belief in evolution made him a confident atheist and a confident communist. Stalin was educated in a monastic seminary but he read the works of Lyle and Darwin, lost his faith, became an evolutionist. His belief in evolution made him a confident atheist, and that's what made him a confident communist. So when people say that communism is the principal error that took hold in Russia, 
in fulfillment of Our Lady's warnings, that is not correct. At the foundation of the communist revolution was this faith in evolution and that science, natural science, could somehow prove that this molecules to man evolutionary mythology was a scientific fact. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing that I want to highlight in this program is the statement that Our Lady made at Fatima that she was going to save the world through devotion to her Immaculate Heart. Because, believe it or not, this is intimately related to the true doctrine of creation that God revealed to Moses as it was understood in the church by all the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers from the time of the apostles. Because in the revelation that God has given us in the Holy Scriptures as they've been understood in the church from the beginning, we know that God created by fiat, by speaking it into existence, this whole universe, the heavens, the earth, the seas, and all they contain, all the different kinds of creatures. He created them by his word, and he created them for us in our first parents, Adam and Eve. And when he created Adam body and soul, and he created Eve from Adam's side, he placed them as the king and queen of a perfectly beautiful, complete, harmonious universe. So what God gave to us in our first parents was, in effect, an immaculate creation. And when you read the fathers and doctors of the church, you'll find that when they speak about the beauty of that original creation, where there was, there was no deformity, there was no disease, there were no man-harming natural disasters whatsoever, when, when doctors of the church like St. Virgin of Sweden, Sweden speak of that original beauty of the original creation, you know what they say? They say that that creation was so beautiful that the only thing that God ever created that is more beautiful than the original creation that he created for us in the beginning is the Blessed Virgin Mary herself. Isn't that beautiful? So when Our Lady told us that she is going to save us through devotion to her Immaculate Heart and through the consecration of the individual members of the mystical body of Christ to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary and through the consecration of Russia to the Immaculate Heart of Mary by the Pope and all the bishops for which, of course, we are all praying every day. What she was also saying is that God is going to restore this world back to something more like that original immaculate creation that he created for us in the beginning. And this is so important because even many faithful Catholics who are trying to be faithful to the traditional Catholic faith, we have all been so brainwashed by the evolutionist philosophy and mentality that is in the very air that we breathe that we don't realize how much it has affected us even when we try to live our Catholic faith in every thought, word, and action of the day. And here's a very simple way to distinguish the true Catholic perspective on human history from the false so-called Enlightenment philosophy perspective, which totally dominates the world today, even in, in Catholic academic circles. The traditional Catholic view is that God created a perfectly beautiful world for us in the beginning, an immaculate creation, which was a foreshadowing of the beauty of the immaculate conception, which God had foreordained before the creation of the world. And therefore, when Adam and Eve sinned, and the harmony of the first created world was destroyed, everything from that point forward, everything that God did was oriented towards the restoration of that original harmony that existed in the beginning. So the gospel 
is about restoration. But here's the thing. Yeah. All the fathers, doctors, popes, and council fathers believe and taught that. But what happened in the so-called enlightenment is that intellectuals within the Christian world embraced the false philosophy that St. Peter predicted would take over in 2 Peter chapter 3, which was based on the idea that the same natural order that we are living in today has existed from the beginning of the universe. Descartes was the first baptized Catholic scoffer who, after he had dabbled in the occult and had three mystical dreams in which he said a spirit of truth possessed him, I wonder who that spirit of truth might have been. It was Descartes who was the first baptized Catholic scholar to begin to be taken seriously when he said that it was more reasonable to explain the origins of things in nature, like stars or plants or animals, in terms of the same natural processes that are going on now, instead of this idea that things just popped into existence in the beginning. And that idea, although Descartes' works were prescribed and put on the index of forbidden books when they were published, little by little, that false philosophy of what we could call naturalistic uniformitarianism, that things have always been the same, the present is the key to the past, little by little, that insinuated itself into the thinking of most of the intellectual elite of the once Christian world. And that's what laid, set the stage for Lyle and Darwin and all their disciples down to the present day. And that's what laid the foundation for modernism. Because when St. Pius X looked at the situation in his day over 100 years ago, what did he see? He saw that already many Catholic theologians, Catholic intellectuals, Catholic leaders, had embraced this false enlightenment philosophy that the gospel is not about restoration of what God created in the beginning. It's about progress. It's about evolution to some utopia in the future. Yes. And this is why in Pashendi, St. Pius X says this modernism that says that everything is in flux, everything's evolving, to this utopia in the future, this is the synthesis of all heresies. Because all previous heresies added something, subtracted something, distorted something, but they left most of the faith intact. But with modernism, because of its premise, its evolutionary premise, everything's in flux, nothing is sacred, everything's got to be changed. The doctrine, the liturgy, everything. And yeah. therefore, he says that evolution is the principal doctrine of the modernists. Yeah, if I could just make a few points here, Hugh. Wow, wonderful. Uh, all the points that you've made. But yeah, definitely progress, quote unquote, change, process. These are all communist, uh, modernist uh, uh, buzzwords, if you will. I mean, they're literally trying to redefine what it is to be uh, a Christian. And I know on your website, uh, ColbyCenter.com, you, you, you have... Dot org. Uh, oh, dot org. I'm sorry. Yes, yes. You have an article uh, concerning that with uh, Tehard, uh, Deshard, Dan. But it's very, very difficult in these times because we see so many conciliar leaders, including the popes themselves, espousing evolution. And I just wanted to bring up uh, an additional point, uh, if I could, concerning the triumph of the Immaculate Heart. One of the reasons why, folks, I, I document all the earth changes or what I identify as what our Lord called the birth pangs is because we have so much error now. There is less truth in the world. There is more sin in the world and less reparation being done. Therefore, there's less purity in the world, if you were, or less holiness. Therefore, we're seeing more and more darkness and chaos in nature itself, so much to the point where, as traditional Catholics, we know what the climactic event will be in terms of the three days of darkness, where everything is in chaos and in darkness. So yeah. what we're talking about today uh, is this harmonious return of creation 
uh, and nature in the triumph itself. And that's what's interesting with Hughes trying to bring out is not only will it be a springtime in the church, if you will, but springtime literally as it relates to nature. Everything will be restored. And so Jesus himself, even in Luke 19, 40, talked about the rocks crying out if we didn't praise God and essentially call him king. Uh, and I'm paraphrasing there, of course. But the bottom line is, folks, we see the Antichrist forces building and building towards this one world religion. And this is what we're heading towards. Nature is in all of re uh, revolt. And so the answer is, as all of the mystics have said and, and the fathers and the doctors and the church have said, return back to Mary and this devotion to the Immaculate. And I would also add to uh, the Sacred Hearts. Continue on, Mr. Owen. I didn't mean to uh, cut you off, but... Uh, wherever you want to go in terms of uh, continuing to talk about the link between the Immaculate Conception or uh, and the Immaculate Creation. Um, I don't know if you want to get into uh, the lies of both atheistic and the theistic uh, evolution, which is brainwashing individuals, but wherever you want to pick up. Certainly. Well, I'd just like to uh, return to this idea of the Immaculate Creation going hand in hand with the Immaculate Conception, because what our children and grandchildren are being taught in almost all Catholic schools and universities and seminaries all over the world is that God created a world full of death, deformity, disease, struggle for existence, creating one kind of creature through this destructive process of evolution only to destroy it to make something better and then destroying that to make something better. So we say that Atheistic evolution turns men into demons, as it did to Lenin, to Stalin, to Mao Zedong, to Hitler, and so many other totalitarian leaders. But what we don't realize is that theist theistic evolution makes a demon out of God. That's a very important pair of truths. Atheistic evolution turns men into demons, but theistic evolution turns makes a demon of God, because the true God is the one who creates everything beautiful, complete, harmonious for us. All the different kinds of creatures, perfect according to their natures, each in exactly the right place in the universe to be part of this symphony of harmonious natures, all of which are created for us in our first parents. And it's only sin that brings the death deformity, disease, and man harming natural disasters into the world. But even in most of the so-called traditional Catholic schools and, and, and uh, religious education programs, our children and grandchildren are taught that God made the world with death, deformity, disease, man harming natural disasters, and that it's only moral evil that came into the world through the original sin. And this is a blasphemy. So when Our Lady draws our attention to her Immaculate Heart, to her, to her identity as the Immaculate Conception, she's also drawing our attention back to the Immaculate Creation, which was the type or foreshadowing of herself. And, and therefore, we need to understand that just as any one of us would fight to defend the Immaculata against any accusation that she had some defect in, in body, mind, or soul, so we should be ready to fight to defend the truth that God created a perfectly beautiful, complete, and harmonious world for us and our first parents, and that it was only sin that brought the death, deformity, disease, and struggle for existence into this world. But instead, we're perfectly content. In fact, we will pay people to teach our children and grandchildren, even in so-called traditional Catholic communities, to teach them that God is a demon who created the world that we see with all of its death, deformity, and disease. And then what happens? When an earthquake occurs, we say, oh, no, we can't say that that has anything to do with sin. Right. That's, just, that's just the way God created the world. And we see that yes. people who dare to say the truth, like uh, one of the uh, people in Italy who was on the Radio Maria broadcast, and someone asked him, is it possible that this earthquake 
is connected to some abominable law that was introduced in Italy against the natural law. And he said, yes, it's very possible he lost his job. That's not allowed. You yeah, Father not... Father Cantola Mesa actually has been uh, putting out that propaganda, too, that it's no way in relation to sin, which is quite scary. <laughs> well, because what happens then is we become deaf, dumb, and blind. God is showing us in every possible way that we need to repent and turn back to him. But the very things that he is showing to us as the signs that ought to be bringing us to repentance, as it did in previous generations going back to the time of the, the you know Moses and, and the Jewish people, we are blind to them because our own leaders tell us, no, 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 God created the world with these diseases and deformities and man harming natural disasters. That's the world God created. You can't say that that's the result of sin. And this is just blasphemy upon blasphemy. But let me point out something else. St. Maximilian Kolbe was one of the few Catholic theologians in the first half of the 20th century to see through all the smoke and mirrors of evolutionary pseudoscience and false philosophy and to say that the emperor of evolution wasn't wearing any clothes. My father was the son of a Baptist minister, went to university in England, lost his faith because of his secular humanist evolution-based false philosophy, went on to become the first ever secretary general of International Planned Parenthood Federation at the very time when IPPF changed its position on abortion and became the world's number one provider of abortion, contraception, sterilization, and sex education. The very, at the very time when my father, like millions of other people then and now, was being robbed of his faith by this evolutionary, evolution-based false philosophy, St. Maximilian Kolbe was writing articles and sending them all over the world showing that the emperor of evolution was not wearing any clothes. And here's one of the most beautiful insights that St. Maximilian received. The last thing that he wrote before he was taken to the starvation bunker in Auschwitz concentration camp was on this theme. He had meditated most of his life on his knees in front of the Blessed Sacrament on the words that our Blessed Mother said to St. Bernadette at Lourdes, I am the Immaculate Conception. And St. Maximilian wanted to understand, why did she say this, I am the Immaculate Conception? And he realized, by the grace of God, that with these words, our Blessed Mother gave the lie to the blasphemy of human evolution. And this is how he explains it. It's so beautiful. He says, Adam was not conceived in the womb of a parent. He was a special creation, body and soul. Eve, he goes on, was not conceived in the womb of a mother. She was created, body and soul, from her husband's side. He continues, our Lord Jesus Christ did not begin to exist in the womb of the Blessed Virgin Mary. He's God. He existed from eternity. Therefore, St. Maximilian concludes, the Immaculate Conception is the unique Immaculate Conception. And think about this. If theistic evolution is true, what's being taught in the overwhelming majority of Catholic schools, seminaries, and universities, even the so-called traditional ones, if that were true, since even theistic evolutionists are bound to accept the dogma of original sin, they must believe that Adam and Eve were conceived without sin in the womb of a subhuman primate. They have to believe that. And therefore, if theistic evolution were true, then the Blessed Virgin would have had to say to St. Bernadette at Lourdes, I am Immaculate Conception number three. <laughs> yeah. Because there was Adam, there was Eve, and now there's, there's, there's me. But she didn't say that. Now, is it a coincidence that she said these words at Lourdes in 1858 on the very eve of the publication of Darwin's book, 
the origin of species. No, it is not a coincidence. Our Blessed Virgin Mary, for those who had eyes to see and ears to hear, gave the lie to the diabolical deception of human evolution. So, my brothers and sisters, if you want to raise your children and grandchildren and friends and relatives and neighbors and acquaintances and anyone you can influence in the true holy Catholic faith that was handed down to us from the apostles, teach them the true Catholic doctrine of creation as the foundation of their faith and expose the diabolical deception of molecules to man evolution as the lie from the pit of hell that it is. Because the, the era of peace and the culture of life will never be built on the foundation of theistic evolution. We will only have an era of peace and a civilization of law and a culture of life on the foundation of the true Catholic doctrine of creation that was handed down from the apostles. And here's the one, one final point for now that I'll make, and if, if we have time to say anything more, that's great. If not, this, is, this will be good enough, God willing. When our Blessed Mother began in these times to reveal the riches of her holiness, St. Maximilian Kolbe realized she's our mom. And like any mom, she wants her children to share in everything that she has. She doesn't want to keep anything for herself. So St. Maximilian had the insight to realize that the more that we consecrate ourselves to our Lord Jesus Christ through the Immaculate Heart of Mary, the more we come to appreciate her holiness as the mediatrix of all graces, co-redemptrix and advocate the more we are going to begin to share in the holiness of our Blessed Mother. And that holiness is the same kind of holiness that Adam and Eve were given in the beginning of creation. I could weep over the number of otherwise very good and holy priests and lay faithful who are under the impression that our first parents were primitive, that God put a soul into them and they were, they were like these primitive children. That is a blasphemy. Read the articles in the Summa on the holiness and the perfection of Adam and Eve. We have an article on our website by Father Thomas Clean, OP, on the original perfection of our first parents. Adam and Eve, St. Adam and St. Eve, were created in the most exalted state of holiness until the original sin. All they wanted to do from morning till night was the perfect will of God. And yet we are so deceived and confused that we allow our children and grandchildren to be taught that they were primitive. My brothers and sisters, we have to see through this deception. We have to go back and teach this fundamental truth and expose the works of darkness which are all rooted today in this false diabolical deception of molecules to man evolution. Folks, if you don't believe Hugh and myself, what we're talking about today, let's hear the words of St. John Vianney himself. In fact, my children, it is sin that brings upon us all calamities, all scourges, all war, famine, pestilence, earthquakes, fires, frost, hail, storms, and all that afflicts us and makes us miserable. Uh, I think that pretty much sums up uh, a large amount of what we've talked today. And for those who've been following Trad Cat Night, you know uh, my conversion story uh, itself. Uh, being a very immoral person, struggling with sex addiction and, and pornography, and I turned to the Blessed Virgin Mary. I picked up the rosary, haven't looked back since, prayed it every day, and so she is necessary in order to maintain purity of soul, purity of the world, in the context in which we've been talking today as it relates to the triumph of the Immaculate Heart coming, but purity of truth. She's the destroyer of all heresies. Who's going to destroy modernism? Who's going to smash it out under her foot? It's going to be through the intercession of the Blessed Virgin Mary. 
Um, now, if I can, Hugh, I did have uh, a few more questions, if you will. If, if you've got time, we can kind of uh, continue on here. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you your take on the whole New World Order social social justice movement as it relates to everything we're talking about. Because as far as I can see it, and this is in a more loose, broad sense, uh, it seems to me that we're going from you know the Catholic version of veneration of Mary and, and turning towards Mary, uh, et cetera, et cetera, to a more secularized, if you will, worship of Mother Earth. And there's a lot of trads out there that see what's going on in the Vatican. They see the environmentalist push, you know, Agenda 21. And the early church fathers warned that in the end, uh, the Vicar of Christ would be driven from Rome and it would return to its ancient paganism. And that's kind of scary to a lot of trads. So how how does the social justice, quote-unquote social justice movement, fit in uh, with what we're talking about today? Well, of course, the true social doctrine of the church is absolutely rooted in the true Catholic doctrine of creation and the sacred history of Genesis. So um, if we want to talk about the true Catholic social doctrine, that's where we're going to find the foundation. And, and we, I won't get into all the social doctrine of the church. I'm just going to leave it at that. But to answer your question, the... The false social doctrine that is so common today is basically rooted in naturalism. Right. Instead of recognizing that the gospel is about the kingdom of God and establishing the social reign of Jesus Christ here on earth and, uh, and especially on leading souls to eternal life, what the false social justice movement does is to act as if the supernatural riches of the church are secondary to the natural goods. And in fact, for many of these social justice advocates, it's as if the natural goods are the only ones that exist. For them, it would seem that eternal life is not even something we should waste our time thinking about. We should be totally preoccupied with the material needs of human beings here on Earth. And so... You can see that this goes hand in hand with the false enlightenment philosophy and with the diabolical deception of molecules to man evolution. Because this false evolutionary pseudoscience is rooted in naturalism, in the idea that things have always been the same from the beginning of the universe. It's all been the same natural processes working from the first moment of the alleged Big Bang, which never happened, and everything can be explained in terms of natural processes. And therefore, everything that makes up reality is just the natural world. And so the only things then that a responsible person is concerned about is natural goods, providing food, clothing, comfort, and these kinds of things to humanity. And this is the inversion of the gospel. Our Lord Jesus Christ says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. They're totally secondary. But the false social justice gospel turns the true gospel on its head and says that it's the natural goods yes. that are the be-all and the end-all. It's, it's no different than succumbing to the three temptations of Satan that he subjected our Lord to during the 40 days, after the 40 days of his holy fast. Yeah, my kingdom is not of this world, Jesus said, and we all know what sect truly naturalism comes from, of course, Freemasonry, and... Uh, Listen, there's a large amount of evidence to suggest that Darwin's father, not only, uh, well, Darwin himself had a hatred for the church, but his father was a well known Freemason. As a matter of fact, I was doing a little bit more research this morning. I found it on uh, more than one uh, Freemasonic lodge, one in uh, St. Patrick in, in Ireland. So that was just uh, well known. And I was tooting the horn some years ago when I. You know, this guy that I've identified as, as being the guy that will show up onto the scene and kind of put this uh, all together, uh, if you will, from the New World Order. Uh, you know, their buzzword for socialism is sharing. And I warned that that would be coming out of the Vatican uh, about a year before they started saying it. 
And folks, listen, they're going to attack the doctrine of original sin next. That's what these individuals uh, plan to do. So be prepared for it. Don't, don't, uh, don't, don't think that it's not going to happen. It is going to happen. They're going to attack the doctrine of original sin next. That's why we've got to get talks like this out. Uh, and again, yes, this false utopian society that's, that's being created. Father Malachi Martin warned about this, this new Tower of Babel. Everything is inverted. Uh, putting the material first and spiritual being secondary. I know you also wanted to talk about this, uh, Hugh. Uh, I don't, you know, feel free to elaborate, but you wanted to talk about Kinsley a little bit and, and the sex revolution and how this kind of fits in. I've had Dr. Judith Reisman on. We had a whole show dis discussing this, but uh, what, what did you want to add in this area? Uh, I, I wanted to, to point out that the whole sexual revolution is – totally rooted in evolutionary pseudoscience and, and the abuse, the epidemic of abuse within the ranks of the clergy is totally rooted in this evolution-based sexual revolution. Let me just briefly mention a few things which are very important for everyone in the audience to understand. And then at the very end, I would like to say a few words about what we're doing in Uganda to build a center of light in East Africa for the good of the whole mystical body of Christ. But Kinsey was raised in a devout Protestant home. And even when he went away to college for a long time, he held on to his rudimentary Christianity. But eventually he came, became an evolutionist, an atheist. And after getting his doctorate from Harvard, he founded a new science, the science of perversion. And this was based on the idea that, you know, back in the Middle Ages, we had this antiquated notion that there was a human nature and there were certain kinds of actions that were in accord with human nature and they were good. And then there were other actions that were not in accord with that and they were unnatural and abnormal and evil. Well, Kinsey had the good news that evolution had liberated us from this medieval antiquated notion because thanks to Darwin, we know that everything's evolving. There's no stable human nature. And what's more, we know that we evolved from a common ancestor with chimpanzees. So we can look at the chimps and the bonobos and the baboons and we see they do all these kinds of behavior that back in the Middle Ages we thought were unnatural and abnormal. So now, thanks to evolution, we're liberated because we see that our cousins do these acts and they're perfectly natural and normal for them. Therefore, they're perfectly natural and normal for us. Now, believe it or not, it's with this evolutionary pseudoscience that Kinsey gets a heap of money from the Rockefeller Foundation to begin his new science of perversion, where he takes deviant people, mostly from a prison population, studies them, fudges his figures, makes it seem that their deviant behavior is much more common than it really is, and then succeeds in changing the criminal code, the medical code, and the psychiatric code to put us in the mess that we're in. But see, that's not the worst abomination. The worst abomination is revealed in an article published by the Theological Society of America by a priest who was the dean of a seminary at the height of the abuse that was going on in this country. And here's his brilliant conclusion. In the conclusion of this article, he says, there is no sexual behavior that empirical science has proven to be in a value-free way detrimental to a full human existence. Let that sink in. Yeah. The evolution-based diabolical pseudoscience resulted in the men who were charged with the formation of the souls of future priests, teaching them that there's nothing you can do that's really wrong. Science, you know, according to empirical science, is it any wonder we see the wasteland that we see? But how many people have identified the root? 
You see, temptation has always been with us. St. Peter Damien rails against the, the clerics who were practicing, who, who were violating the natural law back in the Middle Ages. But here's the difference. Those clerics who violated the natural law and whose sins cried out to heaven for vengeance didn't try to rationalize their sin with some appeal to science. But the people who are perpetrating abuse and covering up abuse today, they have a rationalization. And in so many cases, when people in positions of authority were confronted with direct evidence of abuse, they weren't horrified. They were only horrified when there was publicity, when their pocketbooks were threatened or their reputations were threatened. Then they were horrified. But at the abuse of the innocent, at the abuse of our Lord Jesus Christ, they were not offended. Because these are people who have lost the faith because they have embraced the pseudo-scientific diabolical deception of molecules to man evolution mythology. Mm. Well, very well said. And I think some of the doctors of the church, of course, dating back to tradition, St. Ephraim said concerning uh, the Immaculate Conception, thou alone and thy mother alone are in all things fair there is no flaw in thee no stain in thy mother saint ambrose uh states the same mary a virgin not only undefiled but a virgin whom grace has made invi inviolate free of every stain of sin so of course uh this are quotes that we can use to refute the heretics of our times i also wanted to add too that the the message of la salette and fatima are very well uh, interconnected, if you will, and it also talks about this great renewal to come. In the very, very last sentence, uh, it states this: uh, "Then the water, then water and fire will purify the earth and consume all the works of men's pride." And what did Pope Saint Pius X say, say concerning modernism? Uh, that at the root of it uh, is pride itself. Yes. And every and everything will be renewed. Our Lady uh, says at La Salette, and God will then be served. And glorified. So we truly have two gospels at play. We know this false gospel that we're dealing with uh, since the Second Vatican Council. It's a new everything across the board. They're preparing the way for the new false phony Christ in the world, folks. We've got to hunker down and pray and turn to the Blessed Virgin Mary. A lot going on uh, in the world today, and we have to do our part. Control what you can control. Pray. Make reparation. Uh, offer yourself up a, as a victim. We've got to try to win as many souls to Jesus uh, in the, the, this, uh, you know, the, this dire time, this dark period. And, you know, we are the light. We've got to stay focused in on, on the rainbow uh, as opposed to the storm, if you will, as an eagle. We've got to keep our wings spread in faith and hope and realize that uh, heaven has promised us the victory. Love has the highest seat in the end. It can see all things. And it knows our struggles, trials, and tribulations, and we're going to continue to press forward. And that's what we have to do as Christians. We're, we're cross-bearing. We're, we're not sideline sitters. We're, we're not sitting on the bench and watching the game. We're in the game, folks. And so I appreciate Hugh uh, coming on today with a wonderful talk, uh, which will be entitled St. Colby, the Immaculata and Goodness of the Original Creation. I want to leave you the last few minutes, parting comments, but then you can also add, Hugh, if you like, any upcoming articles, media appearance, what I call shameless self-promotion. Yes, well, what I really want to do is to focus the attention of the audience on the one place in the world where my colleagues and I have found the greatest receptivity to the true Catholic doctrine of creation, and that is the land of the Ugandan martyrs. Um, I don't know how familiar you are with the history of the Ugandan martyrs, but it has a very special meaning for our times because, you see, the Catholic Church in Uganda was founded by French missionary priests in the late 1870s, and those priests preached the faith as it is set down in the Roman Catechism, the Catechism of the Council of Trent. And if you read the explanation of the dogma of creation in the Catechism of Trent, that is the faith of the Church. 
And we are taught in that catechism, God spoke and it was made. He created all the different kinds of plants, all the different kinds of animals, all the different heavenly bodies by speaking them into existence, not through any kind of natural process. And he created them all for us. And he created Adam, body and soul. He created Eve from Adam's side. He placed them as the king and queen of a perfectly beautiful, complete and harmonious universe. And it was only the original sin that brought the death, deformity, disease, and struggle for existence into the world. And our Lord Jesus Christ came into the world and shed his precious blood and founded the Holy Church and sent the Holy Ghost upon us so that we miserable sinners could be incorporated into his mystical body and share one life with him and cooperate with him in restoring the whole world back to the beauty that it had in the beginning and to bring it to an even more glorious perfection at the end. That is the faith that was preached by the French missionary priest. And the Ugandans received it. And the principal leaders of that new church were leaders or administrators in the court of the local king who had learned unnatural vice from Muslim traders who came into the kingdom of Uganda, which became Uganda, from Zanzibar. And what ultimately happened was those new Catholics laid down their lives rather than violate their purity. And it is no coincidence that today, of all the countries that we have visited in the entire world, and we've been on every continent except for Antarctica, this is the country where we find the greatest receptivity from bishops to seminary professors to clergy to seminarians to the lay faithful. And this is what we're trying to do. We're trying to work with the Catholics in Uganda, with the principal pro-life organization in Uganda, to educate the priests, the seminarians, the university students, the young people in the truth, expose the errors of evolution so that their young people do not have to have their faith destroyed as it has been destroyed in the souls of most of our young people in Europe and North America, Australia, the so-called rich countries of the world. And we're doing this with the cooperation of church leaders over there. And we're, but we're doing it against the agents of the New World Order who are funded to the tune of hundreds of millions of dollars to flood this, this country with contraceptives, with sex education, with every kind of perversion, with genetically modified agriculture, which they haven't been able to get in, but they keep trying, and all these abominations so that they can destroy that society as they have destroyed the societies in Europe and increasingly here in North America as well. My brothers and sisters, we have launched programs which, if we bring them to fruition, will ensure that their young people will be protected from modernism. Their young people will be given the true faith, and their young people will be able to go out through the world and actually evangelize the apostate nations. But we need help. We, mostly we need your prayers, but also we are starting projects so that our brothers and sisters in Uganda can earn through legitimate businesses the funds that they need to build a solid Catholic pro-life culture. But we need people to support these legitimate businesses. For example, we have a business that's making men's suits, high quality men's suits for a fraction of what it would cost you to purchase them in Europe or North America. We need customers. If you're interested in supporting this work, please get in touch with me through the Kobe website. But most of all, pray for the success of this apostolate. Because we believe 
that these young Catholics in Uganda, the ones who are really answering and corresponding to the grace of God, they are consecrating themselves to the Immaculate Heart of Mary, and they want to give their lives to carry the true Catholic faith to the ends of the earth. So I commend them and this whole project to your prayers, and I beg you to continue to pray for the Kobe Center that we could fulfill the mission that we received from God and remain faithful to our consecration to Jesus through the Immaculata in every thought, word, and action for the rest of our lives. Amen, and we will certainly keep you in prayer. Uh, I invite you all to continue to uh, offer up uh, your sacrifices and, and sufferings for his cause. It's certainly very, very important, of course, uh, considering all of the different elements that we've talked about today. We truly have two Gospels at play, the Gospel of Man and the Gospel of Christ, and this fits right into what we are talking about concerning the old world order of Catholicism and the new world order of uh, the Antichrist to come. And there are many traditionalists out there uh, who believe we are on the verge of the great persecution. So those poor people in Uganda, uh, Uganda are being persecuted. And uh, there's a lot of Christians around the world dying for the faith. We are going to have to prepare ourselves uh, as well for a, a wet martyrdom, if you will. And we're living in this culture of death, folks. And we've got to continue to turn to Our Lady uh, to go uh, beneath her mantle and, and ask her, to protect our minds, to uh, ask to, to guard over our hearts and all the movements of our heart, to make sure that we're doing everything for Jesus uh, through Mary. And, of course, we see the attack on family and marriage uh, widespread in the conciliar church and just in the world in general. And, folks, uh, I can't say it enough. Uh, she truly has been instrumental uh, for my conversion, and I know many of you who have emailed me have said the same. And so we've got to turn to her. Uh, let's look towards the example of St. Colby uh, himself, uh, who died giving witness to the faith as well. And I just want to thank you for for checking in with us today. Another great talk. We'll try to get him back on in the upcoming months. There's so much to talk about, uh, a lot of great articles, and uh, just general information, a plethora of information on his website, colbycenter.org. I will try to do my best to recirculate some of his blogs and reblog it so we can get some traffic back to the site uh, from our site. And I just want to thank you all for tuning in to Tradcat Night Radio today. Again, check in to tradcatnight.blogspot.com daily. It's updated daily. If you can in this information war outside of your prayers, I ask you to click that PayPal button. Get in the fight uh, financially if you can. And I'm going to have another great special guest uh, tomorrow. In fact, the whole month is just loaded with tremendous guests uh, such as you today. And so, my good friends, until next time, I thank you all for tuning in today. Keep your wings spread in faith and hope. Ave Maria. <laughs>